Hello everyone, this is Iris Trivia, and today I'm going to do something crazy, as I have made a tier list ranking 150 characters that I want to get unique artworks in the next Total War Three Kingdoms game. Now to put this number into perspective, Total War Three Kingdoms has slightly more than 100 unique characters across the base game and all the DLCs. So adding another 150 might sound crazy, but trust me, there are more than enough qualified characters and I had to cut down quite a few to end up with a nice even 150. So don't be surprised if you find some missing from this list. Now because of the sheer number of characters, I have broken all of them down into the following groups, where we have 26 characters for each of the three kingdoms in Shu, Wu, and Wei. Then there are 15 characters for Jin, and 35 for all the current minor factions in the game, Lastly, there are also 12 characters for four new playable factions that I want to see added to the next title, and 10 bonus characters that do not fit anywhere else. And all of them have timestamps below to help subdivide this rather long video. But before we jump into it, let me also explain our approach here, as I have five rating tiers, where S1 are characters who I consider as a must-add for the new base game. S2 are must-adds that are second-generation characters, which would require the game to cover later periods in the form of DLCs. Then following them, I have the A tier, which are characters that deserve consideration, followed by the B tier, or characters that would be nice to have, and finally the C tier, who I consider to be long shots. So with that out of the way, let's get things started with the 26 Shu characters. And going from the top, we have Jian Yong, who, like Guan Yu and Zhang Fei, has served Liu Bei since the very beginning. A well-respected member of Liu Bei's court, Jian Yong frequently served as Liu Bei's envoy and was credited with persuading Liu Zhang to surrender the city of Chengdu. Then moving on, we have Mi Zhu, who not only supported Liu Bei politically by helping him take over the Xu province following Tao Tian's death, but also financed Liu Bei through this rather difficult period of his life. On top of all his contributions to Liu Bei's eventual success, he is also Liu Bei's brother-in-law through the marriage of his sister. Next up, we have Liu Feng, who was Liu Bei's adopted son, and quite a capable general in his own right, as he would shine in the Hanzhong campaign and the subsequent takeover of the Shangyong region. Moving on to add another female characters to the Shu Han roster, we have Huang Yueying, who is the wife of Zhuge Liang a relative to Huang Zhu's clan in the Jin province. Historical accounts of her are scarce, but of all the possible female characters that could be added for Shu Han, she would definitely be on top of that list. Then next up we have Ma Dai, who is the cousin of Ma Chao and the lone survivor of the Ma clan, who will continue to serve Shu Han following Ma Chao's death. Ma Dai's most famous moment would come when he would slay Wei Yan following the power struggles within the Shu Han camp after Zhuge Liang's death during the final Northern Expedition. Now moving on to our S2 tier, or the second generation characters, we of course start with Liu Shan, who was Liu Bei's heir, and the second and last emperor of Shu Han. Following him, we have Guan Ping, who was Guan Yu's eldest son, and the one who would get captured and executed alongside his father after their failed Jin province campaign. Guan Xing, who comes next on our list, is Guan Yu's surviving son, as he left with Zhuge Liang for the Yi province during Liu Bei's earlier campaign against Liu Zhang. Even though his historical contributions amounts to very little, his status as Guan Yu's surviving heir elevates him to being on our list. Then with Guan Yu's sons covered, we also, of course, have Zhang Fei's sons in Zhang Bao, and more importantly, Zhang Fei's daughter in Empress Zhang, who, like her title suggests, is the Empress of Shu Han, as both of Zhang Fei's daughters would actually end up marrying the Emperor and become the Empress of Shu Han, as the first daughter died young. For the purpose of the game, we will just have one representation of her here to avoid any unnecessary confusions. Then moving out of sons and daughters of the three Othorn brothers of the Peach Garden, we have Zhuge Liang's protege and successor in Jiang Wei, who would lead the Shu Han military in the later period Northern Expeditions. 
Next up on our list is General Wang Ping, who actually defected from Wei to Shu Han in the aftermath of Liu Bei's first Hanzhong campaign. From that point on, Wang Ping would go on to prove himself to become a key general in Zhuge Liang's five northern expeditions, which is why he deserves a spot here. And speaking of Zhuge Liang, we also have his successor for prime minister position in Jiang Wan here in S2. Although more of a development-focused prime minister, Jiang Wan was an important member of the Shuhan court from the time of Zhuge Liang all the way to his death. Lastly, for the final spot in our S2 tier, we have Ma Su, who was Zhuge Liang's first protege and someone who is associated with the failed strategies at Jieting, which ultimately doomed the first northern expedition. Even though he did not have any achievements, it is impossible to tell the story of the Three Kingdoms without his presence, and for that, he definitely deserves a unique artwork. Then moving on to the A tier, we start off with Liao Hua, who was an officer under Guan Yu, before he became a quality general in the later periods of Shu Han, as he was one of the few survivors of Guan Yu's last campaign. Joining him in the A tier is Li Yan, who can double as a character for Liu Zhang and Liu Yan's factions, as Li Yan was the leader of the Dongzhou clique in the Shu region, and eventually became co-regents with Zhuge Liang for Emperor Liu Shan after Liu Bei's death. Then for the last member of tier A, we have Meng Da, who can also be double counted as a character for Liu Zhang and even Wei, as he would flip-flop many times before his ultimate death at the hands of Sima Yi. Now moving on to tier B, we start with Sun Qian, who alongside Mi Zhu joined Liu Bei during his time in the Xu province. In all honesty, his achievements are quite similar to the likes of Jian Yong, but because I already have Jian Yong on top of the S1 tier, Sun Qian's addition might feel a bit redundant, but at least he can double as a character for Tao Qian's faction as well, so there are some added value here. Then speaking of time in the Xu province, we also have Mi Feng, who is the younger brother of Mi Zhu. Unfortunately, Mi Feng's most famous moment is his surrender to Wu during Guan Yu's last campaign, which directly led to Guan Yu's death. But that also means he can double as a Wu character in later period DLCs. Next up in the B tier, we have Fei Yi, who is the third prime minister of Shu Han after Zhuge Liang and Jiang Wan. Now, while Fei Yi would not achieve much personally, he was instrumental in resuming the northern expeditions after Zhuge Liang's death. And more importantly, his death would also spell the start of Shu Han's decline as court politics deteriorated tremendously with the rise of the eunuch Huang Hao after Fei Yi's death. Now moving on to tier C, we start with Ma Liang, who is a good personal friend of Zhuge Liang, and the older brother of Ma Su. His biggest contribution would come before the Yiling campaign, where he managed to convince the tribal leader, Zha Mo Ke, to fight for Liu Bei. But sadly, he would also die in the aftermath of the Yiling campaign, which indirectly contributed to Zhuge Liang's close relationship with his younger brother, Ma Su. Then continuing with tier C, we have Wu Ban, who hails from the influential Wu clan in the Yi province. As his fellow clan member, Lady Wu, would become the first empress of Shu Han. He was also quite a capable general under Liu Bei and then Zhuge Liang. In a very similar vein, our next general, Gao Xiang, might not be as well known, but he was quite a capable general under Liu Bei as he played key roles during the Hanzhong campaign and later on during Zhuge Liang's northern expedition as well. Then moving on to a later period general, we have Zhang Yi, who served from Liu Bei's later period until the end of Shu Han, as he would become quite the veteran presence in the Shu Han court and was considered as an equal to Jiang Wei in terms of military experience. And of course, if we're going to talk about the later periods of Shu Han, we need to bring up the eunuch Huang Hao, who became a dominant political figure in the later years of Liu Shan's reign and directly contributed to the end of Shu Han as he interfered heavily with military matters. Last but not least, we have Chen Dao, who was a personal retinue of Liu Bei, and quite the capable general, said to be second only to Zhao Yun, even though there are very little historical records of him, which is why he is the last one here to close out our tier list for Shu. Now with Shu out of the way, let's move on to Wu, which also has 26 characters for this tier list. And starting from the top, we have Lu Su 
who would become Sun Quan's main military commander and chief strategist. Following Zhou Yu's death, he would also become central to the Sun Liu alliance, and for that, he must be added to the next Three Kingdoms title. And this naturally brings us to Lu Su's successor in Lu Meng, whose crowning achievement is his campaign against Guan Yu. Coming from an uneducated background, Lu Meng is a case study in It's Never Too Late to Study, as Sun Quan would encourage him to educate himself as Lu Meng would go on to become quite the capable scholar warrior for Wu. Next up would be Lu Meng's successor in Lu Xun, who would have probably the longest career as the chief Wu strategist compared to his predecessors in Zhou Yu, Lu Xun, and Lu Meng, as they would all die quite young. And in addition to his excellent military track record, which include the victory in the Battle of Yiling, Lu Xun was also in charge of Sun Quan's court, which makes him probably one of the most important characters in the history of Wu. And speaking of court characters, Zhuge Jin is also deserving of a unique artwork. The older brother of Zhuge Liang, Zhuge Jin was a central character to the Sun Liu alliance as he would go on to become a key member of Sun Quan's court. Next up, Ling Tong also joins our list as he earned his place for his rearguard performance during Sun Quan's retreat at Hefei and for his interesting rivalry with Gan Ning. Then moving on to a less military-focused character, we have Lu Fan who was a close family friend to the Sun clan, and someone who was vital in helping Sun Quan in his departure from Yuan Shu and his conquest of the South. Last but not least, in our S1 tier, we also have Lady Wu, who should get a unique artwork simply for being the mother of Sun Ce and Sun Quan. Then moving down to our second generation characters, we start with Zhu Ran, who is a key representative of the Zhu clan of Wu, and a skilled general in the later periods of Sun Quan's reign. Quan Chong also joins this list for being essentially the successor to Lu Xun, although he is perhaps more famous for his marriage to Princess Sun Lu Ban. Then next up we have Zhuge Ke, who was Zhuge Jin's son, a skilled general famous for his ability to bring Shan Yue groups under control. In his early days, Zhuge Ke eventually became the dominant regent after Sun Quan's death. Unfortunately, a string of military failures and political mishaps would eventually tarnish his legacy, but regardless, Zhuge Ke was quite important to the history of Wu. And speaking of failed regents, we also have Sun Jun, a distant relative of the Sun clan. Sun Jun's days as regent was so shameful that eventually the emperor Sun Xiu would move to wipe his name completely from the Sun clan records. But his crew actions, political misgivings, and incest with Princess Sun Lu Ban definitely earned himself a place in Wu's history. On a lighter note, we have Princess Sun Lu Ban's mother, Bu Lian Shi, who was Sun Quan's favorite concubine, and a notable clan member of the influential Bu clan. And of course, if we're going to include the mother, we must include Princess Sun Lu Ban herself, who was Sun Quan's favorite daughter and perhaps the most politically active female of the Three Kingdoms period, as her actions would have a tremendous impact on Sun Quan's decision on heir, and the subsequent political mess after Sun Quan's death. Then last on our list of second generation characters, we have Lu Xun's son, Lu Kang, who is the last great general of Wu, and thus deserves a spot here on our tier list. Moving on to the A tier, we start with Han Deng, who definitely deserves artwork for his long service to the Sun clan, starting from Sun Jian's days. But because we already have so many similar generals in Cheng Pu and Huang Gai, Han Deng ends up often forgotten. Next up, we have Yu Fan, who was an interesting general and strategist for Wu. Better known for his love of alcohol and criticism of Sun Quan at court, which ultimately led to his exile, Yu Fan also can double as a character for Wang Long's faction, as he would serve Wang Long in Kuai Ji before Sun Ce's conquest of the south. Then we also have Ding Feng, who is perhaps one of the longest living generals of Wu, as he would serve from Sun Ce's conquest of the south well into the end of Sun Quan's reign. Known for his unusual height, Ding Feng was a capable general and a notable naval commander. And finally, to close out our A tier, we have Jiang Qin, who joined alongside the more famous Zhou Tai, quite the capable general himself. Jiang Qin just had less heroic moments than Zhou Tai, but that should not be a reason to not give him a unique artwork. 
Then moving on to the B tier, we have Zhu Zhi, who is the more senior member of the Zhu clan of Wu. Although he is quite similar to Cheng Pu and Han Dang in terms of his early service to Sun Jian, he did end up leaving the Sun clan for a while as his excellent performance against the Old Turbans would land himself as the administrator in Wu commandery. He will come back into the fold during Sun Tzu's conquests of the south, but for his short absence, I'm going to have to dock him a tier and put him here in B. Next up, we have Chen Wu, who was a decently important general in the early periods of Wu's history, but unfortunately, he would end up dying at the hands of Zhang Liao during the second siege of Hefei, which is why he only ends up here in tier B. Moving on, we have Lu Dai whose main contribution to Wu would be the takeover of the Zhou province following Shi Xie's death. Next up, we have Xu Sheng, who is once again another character who is similar to the likes of Cheng Pu and Han Dang, but precisely because there are so many of these characters, he might be viewed as redundant, which is why he ends up here only in tier B. And closing out this tier, we have General He Qi, who is quite a capable general in his own right, as his retinues were set to have the best gears within the Wu army. Due to his uncanny ability to use his retinues for smuggling operations in order to gain wealth, which in turn was spent on his own troops. Moving on to C tier, we have Gu Yong, who was notable as the first prime minister of Wu. But unfortunately, he had almost no military track record, so for the purposes of the game, his artwork might be considered a long shot. In a very similar light, we have Bu Zhi, who is another future prime minister with a very scant military track record, as he too joins here in the C tier. And this brings us to our final Wu character in Zhou Fang, who only appears historically for one battle, but the significance of that battle is massive, as it was the Battle of Shi Ting, which not only led to the death of the Wei Grand General Cao Xiu, but it also allowed Sun Quan to declare himself as the third and final emperor of the Three Kingdoms period, so for his false surrender, which set up the battle, Zhou Fang would close out our Wu tier list here. Now moving on, we of course have our final kingdom in Wei, which also has 26 characters for this tier list. And starting in the S1 tier, we have Cao Hong, who surprisingly is not even a starting character in Cao Cao's court in Total War Three Kingdoms. A younger cousin to Cao Cao, Cao Hong joined Cao Cao from the very beginning. And not only was Cao Hong part of Cao Cao's early army, Cao Hong even saved Cao Cao's life during Cao Cao's very first battle against Xu Rong. So it should come in no surprise that Cao Cao relied heavily on Cao Hong in these early days, as Cao Hong was the one left in charge at Guandu when Cao Cao led the raiding party against Wu Chao. So it's a real shame to not see Cao Hong get his own artwork in the game, which is why he headlines our tier list for Wei. Continuing with relatives of Cao Cao, we have Cao Xiu next, who is Cao Cao's nephew. In Cao Cao's early days, Cao Xiu served in the Tiger and Leopard Cavalry, before starting to shine in his own right, starting with the Hanzhong Campaign. After Cao Cao's death, Cao Xiu would see an expanded role, especially after he became one of the four co-regents for Emperor Cao Rei. Sadly, Cao Xiu would see his end from a wound suffered at his embarrassing defeat at the Battle of Shi Ting, but nonetheless, Cao Xiu deserves to have his own artwork. Moving on, we have Cao Zhen, who despite his name, is not actually related to Cao Cao by blood, as he is just the adopted son. Regardless, Cao Zhen rose to great importance as the commander of the Tiger and Leopard Cavalry, and like Cao Xiu, became one of the four co-regents for Cao Rei. Next up, we have a real son of Cao Cao in Cao Zhi, who is known historically for his poetic talents, but also for his fierce battle with his older brother Cao Pi to become Cao Cao's heir. Even though Cao Zhi would ultimately fail to become Cao Cao's heir, his sibling rivalry still had a huge impact on Wei, and would make for an interesting storyline in the next game as well. Now moving away from the Cao clan members, we have Cheng Yu, who was one of Cao Cao's best strategists in the early periods of Cao Cao's career. Key during the campaigns against Lu Bu and the early stages of the Guandu campaign, Cheng Yu is definitely deserving to join the rank of Cao Cao's many strategists who already have in-game art. Then up next we have Guo Huai, who spent most of his career out on the western frontiers of Wei where he was instrumental 
in numerous northern expeditions as he single-handedly halted Zhuge Liang's advance during the first northern expedition and essentially prevented Zhuge Liang from making any material gains when Wei was the least prepared out on the western front. For that alone, Guo Huai deserves to get his own artwork. Last but not least, in tier S1, we have Pang De, who didn't serve Cao Cao for long, but his one moment was quite memorable as he brought his own coffin with him to the defense of Fan City and was true to his word as even when Yu Jin surrendered, Pang De fought on until he was captured. And with his brother working in the Shu Han court, Guan Yu offered him an opportunity to switch sides, but Pang De stuck to his principles and chose execution over surrender. In addition, Pang De's artwork can be double counted as he had previous service to Ma Teng and then Ma Chou, who are also playable factions in the game. Now moving on to the S2 tier, I have Cao Rei as the only character here, as all the other second generation Wei characters who I deem important are going to end up appearing in the Jin tier list as their importance all relate to the usurpation of the Sima clan and the founding of the Jin dynasty. And of course, Cao Rei is here because he's the second emperor of Wei. Then moving down to the A tier, we start with Li Dian, who spent most of his career as a logistics officer under Cao Cao, which is an underestimated and important position in any army. Furthermore, Li Dian participated in the defense against the famed Second Siege of Hefei. Then shifting to a court character, we have Chen Chun, who actually also can double as a character for Liu Bei, as he did serve as advisor to Liu Bei back in the Xu province. But more importantly, Chen Chun was instrumental in the court reform efforts in both Cao Pi and Cao Rei's reign. And continuing with the characters who briefly served under Liu Bei, we also have Tian Yu, who would go on to become a key northern general under Cao Cao, as Tian Yu would not only battle against the nomadic forces in the north, but also play a key role in intercepting Sun Quan's fleet during their communications with Gong Sun Yuan in the Liaodong Commandery. Up next, we have Wen Ping, who also can double as a general for Liu Biao, as he served in the Jin province his entire life, first under Liu Biao in the northern part of the province before becoming the defender of Jiangxia for Cao Cao in the latter half of his career. Last to make it into tier A is Man Chong, who is often seen as a stern and fair official, but more importantly, Man Chong took on the challenge of securing Runan during and after the Battle of Guandu, and then proceeded to take on the defense of Hefei after Zhang Ao's death, as he was responsible for New Hefei Castle and Sun Quan's last two failures at Hefei. Then moving down tier, we have Cao Zhang, who is the middle brother between Cao Pi and Cao Zhi. While he was never considered as an heir due to his lack of scholarly talents, Cao Zhang was a fine general and led many campaigns against nomads in the north before dying of sickness during Cao Pi's reign. And speaking of Cao Pi's reign, Guo Nu Wang is next on our list as she would become Cao Pi's wife and empress after Lady Zhen's death. Then following Empress Guo, we have a few lesser known characters who are all quite significant contributors to Wei, starting with advisor Liu Ye. A distant relative to the imperial clan, Liu Ye is one of Cao Cao's key advisors who served all the way into Cao Rei's reign as he had an uncanny ability to correctly assess and predict situations throughout his career. Moving on, we have Han Hao, who did not get a bigger chance to shine, mainly because Cao Cao relied on him extensively, which is why he always remained close to Cao Cao rather than getting many chances to lead his own forces. And the one time he did get to lead his own force, he helped Cao Cao take control of the Henei commandery, which turned into the spark plug for the Guandu campaign. Of course, Han Hao is also well known for his suggestion of the Tun Tian system. Next up, we have Jia Kui, who is the father of Jia Chong. But unlike his son, who swapped loyalties from Wei to Jin, Jia Kui was fiercely loyal to Wei as he started his career in the north, helping Cao Cao gain control of the Bin province from the remnants of Yuan Shao's forces such as Gao Gan. Then he was eventually reassigned south to the Yang province where he worked extensively on irrigation projects before giving aid to Cao Xiu's disastrous Shi Ting campaign. Finally, our last tier B character is Jiang Ji, who spent his whole career in the Yang province as its prefect under Cao Cao, Cao Pi, and Cao Rei. 
as one of the few people to serve from Cao Cao into Cao Fang's reign, Jiang Ji would also play a huge role in convincing Cao Shuang to surrender following Sima Yi's coup, even though Jiang Ji originally thought Sima Yi was going to spare Cao Shuang's life. Now, continuing to tier C, we have Du Ji, who, like Jia Kui, played a huge role in the northern commandery of Hedong, but since most of his achievements are administrative in nature, he would be a long shot to get his own unique artwork in my opinion. In a very similar vein, we have Mao Jie, who was known to be a fair but strict official under Cao Cao, but without much of a military career, it's hard to see Mao Jie cracking the ready crowded Wei roster. And for the sake of diversity and perhaps a tie-in with nomadic tribes, Cai Yan, who was kidnapped by the nomads before being ransomed back by Cao Cao, might make a good ad, even though her contributions to history is rather limited to her poetry works. Next up, we have Yang Xiu, who would become a central ad if the game ever develops a more robust battle for air system for Cao Pi and Cao Zhi, as Yang Xiu was one of the key supporters of Cao Zhi. And it also helps that he hails from the famous and powerful Hongnong Yang clan. Moving on, we have Xia Houshang, who was a nephew of Xia Houyuan and the key military commander of the Jin province under Wei's control throughout Cao Pi's reign. Unfortunately, he will pass away right before Cao Pi's death, which limited his contributions to just the recovery of the Shangyong commandery, which is why he ends up here in Tier C. Then next up, we have Xi Zhizhai, who is often forgotten as Cao Cao's most trusted early period advisor. He is not often talked about because he would die of sickness in 196, which spurred Cao Cao into looking for his replacement. And that replacement turned out to be none other than Guo Jia. But essentially, without Xi Zhizhai's death, Guo Jia might have never been recommended by Xun Yu to Cao Cao. And last but not least, we have Zhong Yao, who rounds out our last spot here in our Wei tier list. The head of an influential gentry clan, Zhong Yao is better known for his court services and his outstanding calligraphy, which is still considered one of the best in China even today. He is also the father of Zhong Hui, who will be mentioned in our Jin tier list, which is coming up next now that we have wrapped up our Wei tier list. Now for the Jin tier list, most of the characters will be second generation characters as the story of Jin happens on the tail end of the Three Kingdoms story. So for the S1 tier, we only have Zhang Chunhua, who is the wife of Sima Yi, and the mother of Sima Shi and Sima Zhao. And speaking of her two sons, our first character in S2 will be Sima Yi's eldest son, Sima Shi, who played a huge role in Sima Yi's coup, as Sima Shi had been secretly training a personal army, which came in handy for the coup. But unfortunately, Sima Shi would die before the usurpation was ready, as numerous rebellions against the Sima controlled court would eventually lead to his death and the rise of his younger brother, Sima Zhao, who will essentially play the role of Cao Cao, as he would set up the court for his son, Sima Yan, to usurp after his death, in a very similar fashion to Cao Cao's arrangement with his son, Cao Pi, who ended up usurping the Han. And we can't talk about usurpation without talking about the coup, which brings up our next character in Cao Shuang, who is the son of Cao Zhen, and a fellow co-regent with Sima Yi for Emperor Cao Feng. Sadly, it was his political struggles with Sima Yi that would lead to the infamous coup and the downfall of the Cao Wei regime. Now moving on, we have Deng Ai, who heroically brought down the kingdom of Shu Han with his daring march through the Tianlin mountain ranges. Unfortunately, his legacy will become tarnished in his own times due to his entanglement with Zhong Hui's rebellion. But regardless, his heroics against Shu Han alone makes him deserving of his own artwork. Finally, we have Zhong Hui, who is the youngest son of Zhong Yao and the commander of the final campaign against Shu Han. Zhong Hui ambitiously tried to create his own kingdom in Shu after the fall of Shu Han, but lost control of the situation which definitely dampens his reputation historically, but Zhong Hui was a talented individual nonetheless who played a key part in the history of the Three Kingdoms. Moving down to Tier A, we have Jia Chong, who is the son of Jia Kui and a staunch follower of Sima Zhao. His loyalty knew no bounds as he went as far as leading troops against Emperor Cao Mao, which led to the death of the penultimate Emperor of Wei, 
at the hands of just a common soldier. He would also famously marry his daughter Jia Nanfeng to Sima Yan's son and crown prince Sima Zhong, as she would play a key role in triggering the Eight Princes Crisis. But we're getting ahead of ourselves as we move on to Xia Hou Ba, who is the second son of Xia Hou Yuan and an eventual defector, as he would escape to join Shu Han after Sima Yi's coup. And even though he did not contribute much to either side in terms of grand military achievements, his unique role on both sides lands him here in Tier A. Last on our list is Guan Qiujian, who will eventually lead a rebellion against the Sima-controlled court. But the reasons to include him here in Tier A goes much farther than that, as Guan Qiujian was also a tutor of Emperor Cao Rui, and led the first campaign against Gongsun Yuan in Liaodong. He would become politically marginalized after Cao Rui's sudden death, as Guan Qiujian ended up stuck on the northern borders before leading a campaign deep into modern-day Korea. Now moving on to Tier B, we start with Wang Yanji, who is the granddaughter of Wang Lang, but more importantly, she is also the wife of Sima Zhao and the mother to the first emperor of Jin, Sima Yan. Quite active politically in terms of helping her husband, Wang Yuanji is not just a pretty face as she predicted Zhong Hui's eventual betrayal long before his conquest of Shu Han. Next up, we have Sima Yan, Wang Yuanji's eldest son and the eventual usurper of Wei and the founding emperor of Jin. As the final winner of the Three Kingdoms period, Sima Yan definitely deserved his own artwork, but for that to happen, the game would have to cover till that period in terms of DLC support, which is why I have him rather low on this tier list, as I see that as unlikely. Then moving down to tier C, we have Wen Qin, who joins the list of characters who try to rebel against the Sima control court. And alongside him is his son, Wen Yang, who has quite an interesting history of flipping to Wu alongside his father before flipping back to Jin after learning that his father was killed by a fellow rebel in Zhuge Dan. So in a sense, Wen Yang would serve three factions in total. Now speaking of Zhuge Dan, we have a distant relative to Zhuge Liang who served the Sima clan before rebelling against them. While quite a popular leader, Zhuge Dan's rebellion would be short-lived, as his branch of the clan would ultimately be exterminated by Sima Zhao. Lastly, for the last character in the Jin roster, we have Yang Hu, who led the Jin defense against the last kingdom in Wu. His battles with Lu Kang would be the highlights of the final days in the history of the Three Kingdoms, as it became sort of a gentleman's war, with the grand outcome already predetermined. So if the next game ever extends its coverage into the Jin period, Yang Hu would definitely deserve his own artwork. Now with the major kingdoms covered, we move on to the minor factions that already exist in the current game. For this portion of the tier list, the characters will be a bit random as we have many factions to cover, but in general, most characters here are included for their historical or romance contributions, but there are also quite a few characters added to help with game diversity and balance, as there are quite a few minor characters in the game currently that just doesn't have any other unique characters aside from its leader, so adding them here would increase their representation. So starting things off in S1 tier, we have Hua Xiong, who is a key romance general during the fight against Dong Zhuo, as he was the mini-boss before Lü Bu, but historically he was just a supply logistics officer, who Sun Jian kills on his march towards Luoyang, but for his romance significance and general popularity, I'm going to include him here as a must-add. Then continuing with Dong Zhuo's roster, we also have Guo Si, who was at least an equal of Li Jue, as they share the rule of the court in the aftermath of Dong Zhuo's assassination. So if Li Jue got his own artwork in the current game, then Guo Si definitely deserves his own in the next game as well. Moving away from Dong Zhuo's roster for the moment, we have Xu Yu who was the visor who betrayed Yuan Shao during the Battle of Guandu. Although Xu Yu would do very little after joining Cao Cao, he still double counts as a character for Yuan Shao and Cao Cao, and his role during the Battle of Guandu can't be understated, as without his betrayal, Cao Cao could have never won at Guandu. And opposite of the disloyal Xu Yu is the loyal Shen Pei, who defended the city of Ye until his last breath against Cao Cao, 
as he also joins the S1 tier in the form of a general for Yuan Shao and later on for Yuan Shao. Staying with Yuan Shao, who is by far the largest warlord aside from those of the major kingdoms, we have Xing Pi, who also would eventually join Cao Cao, and then go on to have a long and successful political career under Wei. And for his contribution serving in the Wei court, Xing Pi earns himself a spot here in the S1 tier. Next up, we have Huang Zhu, who is a notable non-playable faction leader, who definitely deserves his own artwork as he was directly responsible for the death of Sun Jian and eventually fought in many battles over the course of multiple campaigns against Sun Quan. In a very similar light, Tai Mao also deserves his own artwork as the Tai clan under him became one of the most influential gentry clans in the Jin province under Liu Biao, and it would be through his influence and his sister Lady Tai that the Jin province would end up surrendering to Cao Cao following Liu Bao's death, which directly led to the Battle of Chibi. Next on our list is Zhang Xiu, who is also the leader of a non-playable faction in the game, and he also happens to be a historical vassal of Liu Bao as well. Known for his ambush of Cao Cao at Wan, which resulted in the death of Cao Ang, Dian Wei, and Cao Anming, Zhang Xiu got his start under his uncle Zhang Ji, who served under Dong Zhuo before landing himself in Wan City in the northern parts of the Jin province. And after Zhang Xiu surrendered to Cao Cao, he would serve in the Guandu campaign before eventually dying of illness. Then for the final S1 tier character, we have Zhang Song, who was a court official of Liu Zhang, who extended the invitation to Liu Bei as the disgruntled Zhang Song plotted for Liu Bei to take over the Yi province from Liu Zhang. Unfortunately, their plot would be discovered by Zhang Song's own older brother, who would report him to Liu Zhang, which led to Zhang Song's death. But overall, Zhang Song played a major role in helping Liu Bei take over the Yi province to form the foundations for the kingdom of Shu Han. Now, since most minor factions happened in the earlier periods of the Three Kingdoms history, as the later periods were dominated by the larger Three Kingdoms themselves, I do not have any second generation characters here. So moving directly to tier A, we have Chun Yu Chong, who is a general of Yuan Shao, best known for his failed defense of the Wu Chao supply depot. Historically, Chun Yu Chong did nothing wrong and even fought until he had his nose cut off in battle before getting captured as Wu Chao was attacked without any warning due to the betrayal of Xu Yu, and to make matters worse, Yuan Shao refused to send reinforcements to Wu Chao, opting to attack Guan Du instead. In Romance, Chun Yu Chong is scapegoated as a drunk, but nevertheless, he is an important part to the story of Guan Du, simply because his post determined the final result. Then following him, we have a long list of Yuan Shao strategists in Guo Tu, Tianfeng, Pang Ji, and Ju Shuo. Now I'm not going to be listing the achievements of each of them as they are collectively known for their inabilities to agree on anything as each tried to advance their own post within Yuan Shao's ranks, which ultimately led to Yuan Shao's failures at Guandu and the continued infighting between Yuan Tan and Yuan Shang after Yuan Shao's death as different strategists picked different sons to support. But since Yuan Shao is the most important of all the minor factions and his current roster severely lacks strategies, I felt it was right to put all his advisors apart from the betrayer Xu Yu here in tier A. Now moving beyond Yuan Shao for now, we have Liu Bei's eldest son, Liu Qi, who became an ally to Liu Bei following his father's death. Even though Liu Qi's poor health would cut his life short, his presence still contributed mightily to Liu Bei right before the crucial battle of Chibi. Then next up we have Chen Deng, who also had a short life, but during his time, he first contributed to the downfall of Lu Bu, serving as the inside man alongside his father Chen Gui for Cao Cao and the Han court. Then after the fall of Lu Bu, he became the administrator of Guangling as he would successfully defend the commandery from Sun Ce right before Sun Ce's eventual assassination. An artwork for Chen Deng would also serve multiple factions as he worked under Tao Tian, Liu Bei, Lu Bu, and Cao Cao, while also arguably having his own faction by the end as the administrator of Guangling. 
Then moving down tier, we have Liu Bell's heir and younger son in Liu Tong, who will surrender to Cao Cao after Liu Bell's death. While historically not killed off by Cao Cao, like in romance, Liu Tong would not have any more historical significant event after the surrender either. Hopefully there is a more robust air mechanic in the game, as the selection of air was a pivotal moment for many factions during the Three Kingdoms period. Continue with Liu Bao's family, we also have Lady Tai, who became Liu Bao's last wife and the key reason why Liu Tong was selected as heir over his older brother Liu Qi. Changing factions, we have Luo Jun next as Liu Chong's faction desperately needs another unique character, and there's no better choice than the Chancellor of the Princedom of Chen in Luo Jun. And speaking of minor factions who desperately need unique characters, we also have Shi Hui, who is the son and the eventual heir of the Zhao province following Shi Xie's death. Unfortunately, he would also be the son to ruin the Shi clan in the Zhao province. Then moving on, we have Wang Xiu, who worked in Beihai all his life, so he technically could count as a character for Kong Rong, who desperately need characters, but he also can double count for Yuan Tan and Cao Cao's faction as well, as he would serve all three in very minor capacities. Essentially, Kong Rong really shouldn't be a faction leader, but since he is, Wang Xiu is the best we can do. Now, Zhang Yan's faction also do not have anyone unique, so Yu Du, who is a minor Black Mountain Bandit General, should do nicely here. It also helps that his name has the character for poison in it, which could be played up by the game to give him more poison using troops. So with every faction now having at least one unique character aside from the faction leader, let's return to some more deserving candidates such as General Xu Rong, who served Dong Zhuo. With a track record of beating both Cao Cao and Sun Jian, Xu Rong is the real talent that we should all be talking about under Dong Zhuo. Then moving on to Yuan Xi, Yuan Shao's middle son, who is also the husband of Lady Jin, and potentially a minor faction leader in the Yu province after Yuan Shao's death. It feels only proper that he should get his own artwork as well. Lastly, in the B tier, we end with General Tian Kai, who was a general under Gong Sun Zan, and was one time Liu Bei's direct superior in the area around Pingyuan. Then as we move down to tier C, we return to more Dong Zhuo characters as we have his son-in-law in Niu Fu, who actually survived Dong Zhuo's assassination as he was not in China at the time. Unfortunately, he would die not long after, but he would make an interesting minor faction in the game. Speaking of Dong Zhuo's family members, his granddaughter Dong Bai is a popular character even though she died right after his assassination, but one can dream. Now, with all these characters added for Dong Zhuo, we almost forgot about Yuan Shu, who technically only have Ji Ling as his one unique character. So to add to that, we have Chen Lan, who deserves consideration simply because after Yuan Shu's death, Chen Lan becomes a troubling bandit in the Yang province until Cao Cao finally puts him down. Then in addition to Chen Lan, advisor Yan Xiang, who actually warned Yuan Shu that it was a bad idea to start going down the path of setting up your own dynasty, also deserve some consideration. Lastly, Lady Feng, Yuan Shu's famously beautiful wife, should also be considered, even though it might be a long shot. And speaking of beautiful wives, we also have Lady Zhou, who is the widow aunt of Zhang Xiu, and the widow that Cao Cao should have never slept with, as it came at a heavy price. Then moving on, if Chen Deng ever gets his own faction, then his father Chen Gui should also be considered, as they acted as a tag team, in bringing down Liu Bu from the inside. Another interesting ad would be Wu Yi, who was the brother of Liu Bei's last wife, Empress Wu, and an influential figure in both Liu Bei and Liu Zhang's court. Now I'm putting him here in the minor factions mainly because he should be considered in association more with Liu Yan and Liu Zhang than Liu Bei, which is cheating in a sense as most characters that would work for Liu Zhang would also eventually work for Liu Bei. So continuing with that theme, we also have Huang Quan, who warned Liu Zhang about inviting Liu Bei into Shu before eventually working for Liu Bei. He also can triple as a character for Wei, as after the Battle of Yiling, his forces was cut off in the north. So instead of surrendering to Wu, he took his forces farther north and surrendered to Cao Pi instead. And speaking of Wu, our last minor character is Sun Quan's uncle and Lady Wu's brother in Wu Jing a fellow vassal of Yuan Shu, 
He can double count as a Yuan Shu character and as an independent minor faction leader, which earns him the last spot here in our minor faction tier list. Now for something slightly more exciting is the 12 characters who I want to add as new playable factions in the game. Now what I did here is split the 12 characters into four factions with three characters each, and I will be introducing them faction by faction, starting with Zhang Lu. As an independent warlord ruling over the Hanzhong region, Zhang Lu would make an interesting playable faction, mainly because he ruled out of a cult where he represented the Celestial Master, as his clan founded the Five Peck of Rice sect of Taoism. So his faction will be an interesting mix between Han and Taoism, with a focus on religious tribute in the form of food. Then adding to his roster, we have advisor Yan Pu, who wisely convinced Zhang Lu to not declare himself as emperor, as eventually they would go on to surrender to Cao Cao. And opposite of Yan Pu, we also have Zhang Wei, who was Zhang Lu's younger brother. When Cao Cao launched his Hanzhong campaign, Zhang Lu was unsure if he wanted to surrender or to fight. But Zhang Wei supported resisting Cao Cao and went to war with Cao Cao where he was killed. And his death would convince Zhang Lu that surrender is the only option. Moving on, we have the playable faction led by Gong Sun Du. Now, for those who have seen my Fourth Kingdom of Yan Let's Talk Lore series, Gong Sun Du's inclusion as a playable faction in the North should come as no surprise. And it would also make sense that the two additional characters are his son, Gong Sun Kang, who would first swear loyalty to Cao Cao by executing Yuan Shang and Yuan Xi, and also his grandson, Gong Sun Yuan, who would actually declare Liao Dong as the Fourth Kingdom of Yan and thus dooming their clan as the way retaliation would end their reign in the region. Then for a third new playable faction, I want to add a new bandit faction in Taishan, which was famous for its local bandits, and the best leader for this faction would be Zan Ba, who can double as a character for Cao Cao in the later periods. Joining him would be two other Taishan bandits in Changxi, who is ranked higher, because he would flip-flop his loyalty historically and present the potential as an independent rebel faction leader down the line, and our second character, Sun Guan, who, like Zan Ba, would go on to have a fine military career underway. Lastly, for the final new playable faction, we return to the north with Liu Yu, who was Gong Sun Zan's boss and a fine diplomat on the northern borders, favoring trade and fair policies, Liu Yu was respected in the north by both Han and Normads alike, and his death at the hands of Gong Sun Zan would spark widespread retaliations against Gong Sun Zan, and ultimately doom his cause against Yuan Shao. And joining Liu Yu, we first have Yan Rou, who was a Han citizen kidnapped during his youth by the nomadic tribes. Yet when he grew up, he earned the trust of the same Normads that had kidnapped him, as he went on to become a nomadic chieftain. And after Liu Yu's death, he led the nomadic forces against Gong Sun Zan and eventually became an officer of Wei. Lastly, our final new faction character will be Xian Yu Fu, who worked as a minor official under Liu Yu. But after Liu Yu's death, he would rise to become a general, leading those loyal to Liu Yu against Gong Sun Zan. Now with the new playable faction characters covered, I want to finish things up by including 10 characters that really didn't belong anywhere else, as we have the final others category here. None of the 10 characters here would rank higher than tier B, as they truly don't really belong. First off, we have the legendary traveling doctor Hua Tuo, who plays a key role both historically and in romance as the story of his death and Cao Cao's tumor is historical. Belonging to no factions, he might be an interesting token character with healing-focused skills and bonuses that any faction could grab in-game. Next up, we have three nomadic leaders in Kubi Neng, who was active during the reign of Cao Rei as a northern threat for Wei. Yu Fu Luo, who was a southern Xiongnu chieftain that battled with Cao Cao as an ally to Yuan Shu. And his more famous son, Liu Bao who would help establish a nomadic kingdom during the aftermath of the Eight Princes conflict. Now, all three characters are interesting, and depending on if we ever get a northern nomadic-focused DLC, 
it's hard to say if they will be getting their own artworks in the next game. Then dropping down to tier C, we start out with Zerong, who honestly can be made into a playable minor faction leader himself as his stories of betrayal, embezzlement, and sponsorship of Buddhism makes him quite an interesting addition to the game, even if it's a long shot. And following him, we have Zhu Jun, who like Huang Fu Song and Lu Zhi, were the last bunch of Han generals in this era, and thus deserved consideration for his own artwork, especially since he was Sun Jian's commander during the Old Turban Rebellion. Continuing the list, we have Gao Gan, who is Yuan Shao's nephew and the prefect of the Bin province, probably the last northern faction that Cao Cao had to bring down in the aftermath of Yuan Shao's death. Gao Gan deserves consideration for his own artwork. Another warlord in the north would be Yang Feng, who was a bandit in the White Wave Valley, which honestly could become its own bandit faction, as Xu Huang was also part of this group in the earlier periods. And Yang Feng also played a key role in helping the emperor escape Chang'an, and eventually went on to work for Yuan Shu after being chased out by Cao Cao. Then continuing with similar minor characters, we end up with Han Fu, who was Yuan Shao's boss in the Ji province before being confederated by him. While Han Fu would be rather unimportant, he had a great many talents working under him, such as Zhang He and Xun Yu, who would go on to achieve greater things under Cao Cao. Lastly, the final character on our list is Wang Yun, who played a key role in convincing Lu Bu to assassinate Dong Zhuo historically, and temporarily became the regent in charge of the court in the aftermath. In romance, his relationship as the adopted father of Del Chan is also quite important, which is why he's being considered here. And that's going to wrap up our list of the top 150 characters who needs artworks in the next Three Kingdoms title from Creative Assembly. Now this list is by no means comprehensive as I had to cut out many deserving choices from the list, such as Han Fu's general, Tu Yi, who betrayed him and ended up joining Yuan Shao before single-handedly beating Gong Sun Zan. And there are many others like him that comes to mind even as I was recording this video. So if you feel like any of your favorite Three Kingdoms characters is missing from this list, or if they're more deserving than someone I have on this list, feel free to name drop them in the comment section below. And as always, if you found this video interesting, please consider hitting that like button to help support the channel. And for those of you who want to see more content like this, also consider subscribing or joining the channel as a member to receive member-exclusive videos and other benefits. So thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all next time. Bye!